I'm Tim Hicks, staff writer at San Quentin News. The following episode of Ear Hustle contains explicit language and graphic descriptions of violence that may not be appropriate for all listeners. Discretion is advised. Now, as we walk down the ramp to the left, adjacent the imposing walls of San Quentin, imposing 20 to 30 feet high walls of San Quentin, opposite that is one of the oldest facilities we have on site here at this prison. And this is building here, this granite gray building with this imposing gate in front of it. It's our dungeon. So everything you think about dungeon, dark room, ball and chain, people hanging from walls and being tortured, took place in here from the inception all the way until 1943. You're now tuned in to San Quentin's Ear Hustle from PRX's Radiotopia. I'm Erlon Woods. I've been incarcerated for 21 years and I'm currently housed here at San Quentin State Prison in California. I'm Nigel Poor, a visual artist, now podcaster. I've been working with the guys here at San Quentin for about seven years. And together, we're going to take you on a tour. Something different. Indeed. We house over 4,000 people behind our walls. When you house people in a confined environment like we do here, things are subject to go askew. In that, it's prison. So, you know, there are bad things that take place inside of these walls. And I don't throw that out there to scare you, but I do want to make you aware of the type of environment that you're walking into. That's Lieutenant Sam Robinson, the public information officer here at San Quentin. He's the guy who has to approve this podcast to make sure that nothing in it is going to adversely affect the safety and security of the institution. Lieutenant Robinson is also the guy who gives tours of the prison to outside groups. That's right. And he's done it hundreds upon hundreds of times. He got this shit memorized. Oh, he does. <laughs> down to a science. When we walk inside of San Quentin, it's not like you're at the zoo, where the guys are on one side of the fence and on the opposite side. It's not like that. You're going to be immersed within our population. And so there are a couple of things you need to be aware of. What does it mean? What do you think it means when I say that we have a new hostage policy? A few weeks ago, Lieutenant Robinson gave Ear Hustle a tour, and we got to see parts of the prison we'd never seen before. It used to be this Victorian structure. Uh, I've been all around this prison. All the ins, the outs, the nooks, the crannies, the cubby holes, and I thought I had seen it all, but I hadn't. Well, my friend, there's a lot to cover here. Yeah, because San Quentin is hella old. Oh, parts are really old. Some of it was built back in the 1850s. And a lot of the history that Lieutenant Robinson likes to talk about, it was news to me. Oh, so much I'd never heard before. However, not only was it designed to house inmates, it was also designed to house the staff that works here at this prison. But initially, Normally, we get guys inside to tell their stories. But this place itself does speak, and it's not always through words. Right. I mean, there's a story everywhere you look. If you know how to look. Because there's no question in my mind that in the 165 years we've existed here, blood has been spilled just about every square inch of this place, lives have been lost. And our staff and our inmates tell these stories about these images they see floating through our housing units. It was just he was talking about ghosts there, ghosts from San Quentin's past. On this episode of Ear Hustle, we're trying something different. We're going to listen to some of those ghosts. I saw them not as strangers or criminals or even numbers on a file card, but as human beings whose virtues and faults I knew better than anyone else, whose case histories I had studied for the parole board, whose wives and mothers and children I had known from many a tearful visit over the years. Those are the words of Clinton T. Duffy from his book, The San Quentin Story. He's an interesting character. Oh, yeah, he really is. He grew up here, his father was a guard, and Duffy himself became the warden in the 1940s. His book was published in 1950. Talk about family business. Mm -hmm. Warden Duffy was a reformer. Some of his ideas were far ahead of his time. I had known about the dungeons since childhood, for my father often talked to us about what he called the shame of San Quentin. But I had never seen this dreaded subterranean hole until the day I was sent there to interview the occupants for a census report. So it was 
step inside. We have a series of 14 wells. Uh, and any of the guys in blue that make it down here to see it with me. The dungeon was a black tunnel about 50 feet long with seven small cells on each side. The ancient mass of rock and concrete had the musty odor of a tomb. No sunlight had touched its moldy walls for almost 90 years, and the foul air had no place to go, for there were no windows and the cell doors were hand-forged iron. Six feet wide and um, maybe about 14 feet deep. Each of these wells, uh, today it doesn't have it, but when we operate the dungeon, each of them had big solid doors in front of them. And so no matter what perspective you're in, you're securely locked away in the dark. In each room, we give three conveniences, which are three buckets, one with water and two that were empty. And over the course of a minimum of three days, they'd have to navigate that in the dark amongst themselves. And there are things in bed each cell was nothing more than a niche cut into the stone, and the walls and floor were bare. There was no light, no bed, no ventilation, no toilet facilities, not even a bench. There was sometimes three or four men in one cell, and there was no place to sit except a triangular block of concrete in one corner. Well, after three days, we'd come back over, we'd reassess a guy. If he had learned his lesson, we didn't think he was a knucklehead anymore or anything like that, we'd let him back out in prison. If we still thought he was a knucklehead, then we kind of changed the dynamics. And there are things here in bed and top of the wells. We'd string guys up, leave them hanging for days on end. We'd beat them and torture them. There were actually instruments of torture designed here at San Quentin to trick the behavior of people we locked away in these wells. Prisoners slept on the damp floor with one blanket, if they were lucky, and they got bread and water at the whim of the guards. I had to use a flashlight to take my notes, and for weeks afterward, I was haunted by the memory of the shrunken faces I saw in the dim light, the smell of the living dead, the drip drip of moisture from the vaulted ceiling. Well, in 1943, Warden Clinton Duffy, uh, who was newly appointed warden here at San Quentin, made the decision that torture wasn't necessarily the best way to go about things. So we had all the doors removed from the dungeon with the thought it would have made it difficult for anyone to come, on, come along after him to reopen and utilize for those purposes. And we haven't utilized the dungeon since. Centralized in the in the frame is a, is a blood spatter that looks like there's been things drugged through it, probably someone's body. And then there's this crudely drawn chalk outline. It was drawn very poorly. Like they literally just like outlined the body and then drug it out of the way and then took the picture. Lieutenant Robinson gives a great tour. But photos, Nige, are another window into the past. That's your lane. Yep, I'm a photographer. And about five years ago, I was in Lieutenant Robinson's office, and he pulled out this box full of hundreds and hundreds of 4 by 5 negatives, and that really caught my attention. Over the past several years, I've been archiving them, and I started a project that actually predates this podcast, bringing these pictures into the prison to see what guys would make of them. Uh, it looks like it might be uh, on a stone floor. It looks like it's on a tier because I see part of a staircase. That's Mesro. He's been on a podcast before talking about dungeons and dragons. I don't know. It, it, whoever's standing there has got shiny black shoes. It's so. hard to tell exactly what is going on in many of these photographs, but we do know the dates of most of them and that they were taken by COs. The photo Mesro is holding looks to be a murder scene. It was taken inside San Quentin in 1965. And then it's like the blood is like spattered. There's like this smear that's in the middle uh, that makes me know that maybe the bulk of his body was probably drugged through his own blood in order to get him out of the way. The fact that somebody took the trouble to trace this thing out and then turn around and add an insult to injury and did it kind of terribly, right? Uh, it just it uh, sticks in my craw a bit. These photos, they're just amazing. And because they're mysterious, they make you look even more closely for clues. When I asked the guys to look at them, I wanted the images to be prompts to help them access their own memories. The photo of blood inside a chalk outline 
brought up memories for Mesro. Now, can you tell me a story based on looking at this image? So I used to hang out with this white guy named Shred. Uh, I never knew his real name, you know. And he was uh, kind of like a skinhead variant, I guess. I'm not really up on, like, uh, the gang things and, like, the stuff with the Aryan Brotherhoods and all that. But he had, like, a lot of uh, Norse stuff tattooed on him and, uh, you know, iron crosses and like that. Shred was hysterical. He was a, he was one of the funniest guys I've ever met. Like, he had jokes all day long. And so... Uh, despite what people would think about, you know, whatever racism or policy or whatever that is, like we always used to meet up with each other going to and from child when we were in reception. And um, he would always be, we'd always be cracking these jokes and talking crazy to people and, you know, and just laughing and, you know what I'm saying? He was a really cool guy. And one day we were coming back from dinner. Uh, he saw someone and he started screaming out, 88! Eighty-eight, and he like rushed this guy, pulled out a couple of box cutters, and like sl- cut this guy to ribbons, like right in front of like, you know, the cops and God and everybody. And it was it was one of it was a very horrific thing to see someone get sliced up with a bunch of box cutters. Uh, his face was turned towards me with his dead eyes, right? They hadn't closed his eyes, and so it's like in in my eyes, it felt like he looked at me like, "Why didn't you stop him from killing me?" And there was really nothing I could do, right? It was so sudden. Uh, I still have dreams about that sometimes. Uh, Were you surprised that your friend did that? I was because, you know, even though we had spent, like, a lot of time, like, you know, cracking jokes and stuff, we hadn't really, uh, I didn't really know that that guy, I mean, like, his name, Shred, was kind of a giveaway, but like some people take on names that don't really fit like who they are or what they do. So I just thought it was, you know, personally, I just thought it was a cool name. So I was like, okay, Shred, that's a cool name, right? I didn't realize that his name was Shred because he shredded people. So I'll tell you, the reason why I stopped here, and it always humbles me when I stop at the outdoor restroom facilities here in the prison, um, and I stop here for a reason, because there's a story I always, I always stop and just kind of hone people into, in that when I was a brand new cop and I worked on death row, I remember many days in the mornings, we served their meals inside their cells, and, and, and if you're the second cop feeding breakfast in the morning, you would feed, you would pour a beverage and so whether the beverage was coffee that was hot or tea and every once in a while they get a juice like an orange juice or a cranberry juice or whatever the case may be and so whenever we served cold beverages I remember I remember it like it was yesterday many of the guys in there have tumblers with lids on it and if they got a cold beverage and if they hadn't consumed their beverage when you would come back to them to take them out to yard and when you take them out to the yard, you got to do this unclothed body search on them inside their cells, all that, go through all their stuff. Many times what I would witness is the guys would take their tumbler, if they hadn't drank their beverage entirely, they would put the lid on the tumbler, and they would walk it over, and they would drop it in the toilet. And as a new cop, the first time I saw it, it blew my mind. I just didn't know. I didn't understand what was going on. Because, you know, I'm the type of guy, you know, I'm, I'll clean my toilet, but never, ever would I consume anything that comes out of my toilet, right? It's just, it's just not what you do. And so after I got a little more comfortable working in the environment, I remember I asked a guy, I said, hey, man, look. I said, why are you putting your beverage in the toilet? I said, that's just not what normal people do. And he said, he said, Robinson, he said, look. He said, if I leave my cup out here on the shelf, he said, when I come back, I come back four hours later to a warm beverage. He said, if I put it in the toilet, that toilet water is cold and it acts as a refrigerator. So when I come back, I come back to a, a cold beverage. And so the tight confinement, toilets as refrigerators, it just really, really honed my mind into thinking that I didn't ever, ever want to do anything in life where I put myself in a situation where I ended up being incarcerated in prison.
It seems to me that I have been acutely aware of San Quentin's condemned row, like a sore that refuses to heal as far back as I can remember. It probably began in the little San Quentin schoolhouse, where an eccentric teacher named Miss Redmond took a sadistic pleasure in arousing her pupils to the horror of the gallows. On execution morning, she was pale and tremulous and would usually make the grave announcement that a man was about to be hanged. In the building right over there, she would hiss ominously, pointing to the brick furniture factory. Just think of it, children, that poor man. It was never news to us, of course. Every San Quentin youngster knew the meaning of the deathly stillness that fell upon prison town on those gloomy Friday mornings. Those of us whose fathers were assigned to duty in or around the gallows building were especially disturbed, and even under ordinary conditions, we would have found it difficult to concentrate on our schoolwork. But Miss Redmond wasn't satisfied with that. Shortly before 10 o'clock, as the death march began, she would put down her book and say, Oh, children, that poor man has only 15 more minutes to live. She had an old-fashioned pocket watch on her desk, and sometimes I can still hear it ticking away in that hushed room. Now it's only 10 minutes, she would whisper. She had learned somewhere that it took between 10 and 15 minutes for a man to die on the rope and she had it timed in her own mind until at last she could groan, There, it's done. He's dying. Dying. And while a man was dying and a woman with a twisted mind extracted a perverted pleasure from it, 15 or 20 small boys and girls were being scarred with psychological wounds that few of them ever forgot. My name is John Robb, and my, my CDC number is C44202. I was here in uh, 77, 78, 79. So um, tell me, can you, what was your first, what's your first memory of stepping inside San Quentin in 1977? I'm at the end of the world. Life as I knew it before was over, and uh, I'm going to die here. And were you on the main line? No, I was, I was on the row. I was sentenced to death originally. I remember having to go to South Block Hospital, and there's like eight guards that take you down the elevator. And you can never get over that dead man walking, because they would scream that out. And, you know, dead man walking, like right now they'll say escort. Well, they used to say dead man walking. And as I'm shackled, you know, with my leg chains and or my, my waist chains and stuff, and I'm going to the hospital, they would say that. Who would yell that, dead men walking? The officer. Whatever one that was ahead to let uh, other people know that there was a dead man walking, stay out of the way. I didn't know that was real. I thought that was just Oh, yeah, that movies. was very real. I, I still hear it in my head. And that's the way you're treated. You're dead. Well, um, I'm looking at a uh, medical staff, probably a doctor, and there's an inmate that's holding a black cap close to his chest, and there's a doctor there with a stethoscope that's listening to the cat's heart. The cat's all wide-eyed and everything, and yeah, that remember, that, that's a strong memory for me right there on that. I raised a cat in West Block. They allowed me to do that. How'd you get a cat? Um, I was in maintenance. I worked maintenance a lot. In the maintenance, there was a pit. I stepped down in it, up to my chest. I mean, and there's a pipe going through the ground. And I kept hearing a screaming, like a little little cat, little something. So I got in this hole, and I reached in there, and there's a bunch of fur all torn up. But here's this little tiny baby cat. He barely had, didn't even have his eyes. 
eyes open, and I stuck them in my pocket, and I took them home, and I got a little uh, a barrel off a of binky, you know, and stuff to, to feed it. I, you know, cleaned it, and I fed it. Uh, it liked uh, powdered uh, egg mix, you know, so. And I mixed that. Oh, he was hooked on that. He'd be quiet. I had to get up, like, every so many hours. I'm going, dude, what are you screaming for? You're waking up everybody. And then I would feed him. And it just got to be a regular habit because he was my buddy. You know, I had... I think that's pretty much why they let me have them because it kept me mellow. It ha I had something to go back to myself. All right, so as we stepped inside the facility, I think the first thing your eyes are attracted to are the fronts of the sails because they're all darkened with this black mesh in front of it. Well, that black mesh is there for a purpose. Um, in the movies when, and in and, and prisons, you'll see open bars where guys are able to reach out through the bars and, and grab or throw or whatever the case may be. And uh, in 1985, the last murder employee here at San Quentin took place, not with an inmate that was out walking around them and, and, and stabbing the employee, but the inmate was actually inside of his cell. And he was inside of his cell, he manufactured a spear inside of his cell, and as the employee walked past the cell, uh, he lunged the spear through cell bars and murdered our employee. So after that, we, did, we uh, went on a, uh, a building spree to protect our employees, and in front of all of our cell bars, we designed this wire mesh fronts to prevent guys from spearing our staff from inside the cells. It looks like metal frames. Um, a bunch of little metal square frames and then inside of these square frames are small pieces of glass. And this one glass that looks like it has a hole in the middle where it looks like a rock or something has been broke and you have a hand pointing at the hole inside of the glass. It's weird, right? Yeah, it's strange. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what, what do you, why do you think that picture was taken? I don't, I don't know why it was taken. Um, it... It, actually, I, to be honest with you, if this is a prison, I do know why it, it was taken. <laughs> because people can take a piece of this glass and use it as a weapon, you know. Um, so the picture was taken so that it would be identified that this particular glass is broke in this particular area. Oh, God. How many weapons could be made out of that broken pane of glass? Oh, I'll say about 10, maybe 20, depending yeah. on how small you cut the knives. And so it reminds me of a story, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So um, my first time in prison, uh, I went through Tracy, which Tracy is a reception center, right? Everybody go through the reception center. So I went through Tracy um, during a period where it was the summertime. It was very hot. Like how hot? Oh, Tracy gets at least, it gets over 100 degrees in that area, right? So there's no ventilation in these cells, you know, it's an old prison. Tracy's an old institution. So a lot of people, you know, break, they, break the windows just so they can get air and not necessarily for a weapon. So do you almost feel like you can't breathe? It's so hot? Yeah, it's, it's really hot. It's very hot. People lay on their bunks with just their underwear on and don't move. And so when, the win when you break a window, what changes in the cell? <laughs> You can you can get some type of air. I, I don't. I wouldn't say much, but any air in that situation is good. So you can hear people yelling across to the other building when they hear somebody break a window. Break another one, brother! <laughs> you hear that all day long. Break another window, brother! And everybody go through Tracy know that term. Break a window, brother! Break another one, brother! If I knew why certain men, especially those who haven't much time to serve, 
will suddenly jeopardize their whole prison record and risk an added five-year penalty for a few hours or days of uneasy freedom, I would certainly do something about it. For want of a better name, we call this affliction parolitis, and occasionally an intelligent man recognizes the symptoms and begs us to keep a close watch on him until his parole day. But most of them do not understand their deeply buried motives, and the remorse of a man who realizes he has double-crossed himself, not us, is a painful thing to see. I'm looking, I'm looking at a picture. It looks like a training photo for people that escaped. It's uh, probably the back of a truck. There's a bunch of boxes of cans that are empty. They're tomato cans. And inside these tomato cans is a cleared out space where it looks like an inmate sitting to escape. And uh, I've known a few people that escaped from there. You, ha- you do? Yes. Oh, can you tell? Uh, well, there's one dude named Red. I'm not going to use his real name because he ended up getting killed here. But uh, Red escaped in a truck kind of like this, just like this. And uh, when he escaped, he hit the bay. He hit the water too soon. And it was at night when he, because he got out and he got out of the truck and he was hanging out. And then got dark and he hit the bay. Well, this is the Alaskan Gulf water. This ain't the, this ain't the Caribbean water. So he hit the bay and he started freezing and he got out. And the tower that's out in the back, the back entrance tower, the cop was asleep and Red leaned against the fence and he was, hypothermia was setting in and he was shaking so bad that he rattled the fence enough to where it woke the cop up and that's how he got caught. We'll be right back after the break. see two people that are very in love um, they're they're deep in a kiss uh, this man has his hand around her shoulder around the back of her neck she's holding his chin um, while they're kissing with their eyes closed the kiss is really potent isn't it yeah yeah they, they, they seem like they're really deep in love and that they don't care that someone's photographing them they're so relaxed they're just into it you know so what does the what does the picture make you think about? It reminds me of a picture that I took with my first and only so far my only love, the only girl I ever fell in love with. We were, I believe, sixteen. We were just crazy in love. The setting, uh, the way they're kissing, the arm placement, the hand placement, everything is exactly the same. My hand was on my knee. Her, her hand was on my chin, my arm was around her, our eyes were closed, our mouths were together. Uh, I just remember feeling so, so, like, the, the, like, it just felt so right. You know, I felt so relaxed, I felt so in love. I felt like I just wanted to be lost in that moment right there forever. And what happened to that love? A few years later, I ended up getting in trouble um, as an adult, and I went to jail, and I ended up catching a 10-year prison sentence being that I'm gonna go away for 10 years, that, that I couldn't just sit here and hold her down, you know, so I, I told her to just move on. It wasn't for seven years until I actually reconnected with her on a, on a prison payphone. When I called her on the prison payphone here, you only have 15 minutes. I remember thinking there's so much I wanna say, but I can't say it all in 15 minutes. What am I gonna do? Like, and, uh, when I was talking to her on the phone, I was still in prison, but mentally, I was either 15 or 16 years old, and I was everywhere we were back then. Uh, I was hanging out at parks, meeting her friends, and camping, and renting out hotel rooms behind her mom's back, and sneaking into her room. <laughs> and uh, so uh, it really took me to a whole nother place. The last thing that I heard her say on the phone was, take care and be safe. And then the phone went dead, really. 
I got up and uh, I look around and I'm back in prison again and a bunch of crazy people around me yelling and screaming and doing what they do and I just I wanted to go back to my cell and, and I just wanted to cry really um, but I just I held it in and I ended up just writing a song Yesterday, lost in a moment forever. Your hazel eyes are like the stars in the sky. Your summer sun dies on the lake. You and my arms left me frozen in time. Everything else went away. And right then I know. I wish that I can just stay that moment forever. In that moment forever. All right, folks. Well, this is where I get to get off the tour train with you, but hopefully during time and date we spent with each other today, hopefully I was able to enrich your thoughts about what we do behind the walls of places like this every day. Thank you, guys. Whoa, whoa, whoa. No, 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 no. Oh, that's that was great. <laughs> well, so what part of the, of the prison do you like talking about the most when you do a tour? I'll tell you this. I, you know, I remember looking from a very, very hard and difficult environment, looking out of the windows of the Adjustment Center and seeing volunteers coming to the prison and not understanding what that was about because the guys I was dealing with would kill you if you give them that gave them the opportunity um, or if you slipped up or made a mistake and you'd see the people who were moving around freely that these people were engaging with them differently and I didn't understand it I didn't internalize it that that the guys outside were any different than the guys inside uh, but they were a different place and uh, just being in there and being in the adjustment center, I think I learned what prison potentially is about. And just because a day is difficult, just because a, a guy is giving you a hard time, just because you got to go in and you have to be physical with a guy, it could be not that it's personal, but it's just the business of the day. It's not just a dislike for you. It's just what they have to do to get across a point. And I think that's where I truly learned to take a man where he is at that day or at that point in time and take him for who he is then because 15 minutes from now, it can be something that's completely different. Um, uh, the next day, it can be completely different. And that could be for better or for worse. Thanks to Lieutenant Sam Robinson for giving us that tour of San Quentin. There's so much he said that we couldn't squeeze into this episode, but maybe we'll hear more from that tour another time. Thanks to Greg Sayers for talking with us and singing that song. Thanks to Norman Wahoyt for his escape story and to Bonnaroo for looking at that picture of the broken window with me. And thanks to John Robb and John's cat. That was so cute. <laughs> John, you lucky, because they don't allow cats in here. I've never seen one in San Quentin. Big thanks to Mesro for sharing his story about Shred. Lee Jaspar was the man behind that wonderful voice reading excerpts from Warden Duffy's book, The San Quentin Story. It's not in print anymore, but you can find old copies online. And speaking of Warden Duffy, Erlon, I know he's been dead a long time, but we owe him a lot. Real talk. Warden Duffy was ear hustling long before us. Check this out. I wanted to tell the people what we were doing. And I got the brash notion that if we had an all-inmate package show, to use the trade term, we might get it on the air. An inmate rounded up 30 men who were interested in choral work and started a glee club. We rehearsed the singers with the orchestra for two or three weeks and then recorded a sample program. 
I put the platter in my briefcase and went to see the manager of one of the most powerful stations in San Francisco. I told him what I wanted and offered to play the record. A bunch of cons on the air, he bellowed. I should say not. You must want me to get fired. I went to another station a few blocks away. The manager there was polite and friendly, but he said he couldn't use our show even if we had Humphrey Bogart in the cast. I tried two more downtown stations, but they didn't want any part of San Quentin. By this time, my ardor had cooled considerably, but I was willing to try one more, KFRC, mainly because I had to pass the station on my way out Van Ness Avenue toward the Golden Gate Bridge. To my surprise, the manager, Bill Papps, listened to me eagerly and said he thought it was a unique and intriguing idea. San Quentin on the Air, as our show was called, made its debut from the small mess hall in the prison on January 12, 1942. I felt that with the magic of radio, we had penetrated the invisible wall. In a matter of weeks, San Quentin on the Air spread to more than 300 stations coast to coast, and the San Quentin post office staff floundered in a sea of some 4,000 fan letters a week. 4,000 letters a week? Damn, we don't even get that many. Okay, no we don't. But we do get emails and we get comments on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all of that stuff. We appreciate that, for sure. You can see images from the San Quentin archive, including the ones guys talked about in this episode, on our website, earhustlesq.com. Just go to the gallery page. And if you want to know more about the photo project Nyaj mentioned at the top of the show and you happen to live in Milwaukee, check out her exhibit at the Milwaukee Art Museum. It's called Nyjapur and the Men of San Quentin. It's up until March of 2019. Ear Hustle is produced by myself, Nigel Poor. And me, Erlon Woods. With help from outside producer Pat Masidi Miller, who also comes in to work with our sound design team. This episode includes music from David Jossi and Antoine Williams. Curtis Fox is our story editor, Aaron Wade's our digital producer, and Julie Shapiro is our executive producer for Radiotopia. We want to thank Warden Ron Davis, and as you know, every episode has to be approved by this guy here. Again? Yes, it is me again. This is Lieutenant Sam Robinson, the public information officer at San Quentin State Prison. It is easy for me, this is the first one that's truly easy for me to say I approve this episode. Next time on Ear Hustle, it's our Catch a Kite Q&A episode. Where we answer questions from listeners, and this time, we really mean straight from the listeners. I am a formerly incarcerated woman. My question for y'all is this. What is the one misconception about prisoners and or prison that you wish the greater public did not hold? Ear Hustle is a proud member of Radiotopia from PRX, a collection of the best podcasts around. Hear more at radiotopia.fm. This podcast was made possible with support from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, working to redesign the justice system by building power and opportunity for communities impacted by incarceration. I'm Erlon Woods. And I'm Nigel Poor. Thanks for listening. Ear Hustling! Radio Tokyo.